March 11, 2011, 2.46 p.m. A powerful earthquake shakes Japan. It unleashes towering tsunami that devastate the northeast coast and send a nuclear plant spiraling out of control. Newsline has brought you stories of those who lost loved ones, of the struggle to rebuild communities and lives. People have made progress, but the road ahead is still long. Path to Recovery, three years on. For people in Japan, what happened three years ago is still very much alive. Next week, they'll commemorate the anniversary of a day that changed so much. We're looking all this week at how the disaster affected families, how survivors they're getting over what they lost, and how they're preparing for what lies ahead. The events of that day were unprecedented. And a warning, some of what we're about to show may upset some viewers. A magnitude 9 earthquake struck off the northeastern coast of Japan. It was the most powerful ever recorded in the country. A gigantic tsunami followed. Waves higher than 10 meters slammed into coastal towns and cities, destroying everything in their path. More than 18,000 people died in the disaster and its aftermath. More than 2,600 others are still listed as missing. The quake and tsunami knocked out all power sources at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear complex, causing meltdowns in three reactors. Enormous amounts of radioactive substances were released into the atmosphere, contaminating vast areas both on land and at sea. The people affected by the disaster have spent the past three years working to rebuild their lives. But there's more work to be done. Japanese government officials estimate that tsunami generated more than 27 million tons of debris. Workers had removed 93% of it by the end of January this year. That doesn't include areas evacuated after the nuclear accident in Fukushima. More than 90% of hospitals and schools that shut down in the region are back up and running. And essential services such as water and sewage have almost completely been restored. So the basic infrastructure is coming back into place. However, many are still struggling. More than 230,000 people lost their jobs. Employment has started picking up. But the region's main industries haven't yet recovered to pre-disaster levels. Fishing has traditionally been a way of life for many people in the area. As of now, just 37% of fishing harbors damaged in the disaster have reopened. And as for farmers, many of them are not able to harvest their fields. One third of farmland affected by the disaster still can't be used. Resettling people who lost their homes is another pressing issue. More than 270,000 of those who were evacuated are still living in temporary housing. The situation is particularly complicated in Fukushima. People there have been dealing with damage from the tsunami and also with the effects of the nuclear crisis. This map shows areas that were evacuated after the accident at the nuclear plant. Most of the people who fled are still waiting to learn when or if they'll be able to return. NHK World's Junyo Tsumoto takes a look at how one man's life has changed. One of the few pleasures Soichi Saito enjoys these days is spending time with his dog. I walk my dog every morning and evening. That helps me more than anything. I don't have to think about anything when I'm with you, right? Saito tries not to dwell much on how life used to be in his hometown, Futaba. His family farmed there for more than 500 years. They were particularly proud of their spinach. It won prizes for its high quality. Saito did worry about one thing. His house and field were about three kilometers from Fukushima Daiichi. He was concerned that an accident could occur at the plant, particularly that it could be hit by a tsunami. His worst fears came true. He remembers the repeated discussions he had 
with the staff from the nuclear plant. I had asked the plant's operator over the decades to protect the plant against tsunami. They just laughed and said that kind of accident would never happen. The nuclear accident forced Saito and other residents to flee. He now lives in another city about 40 kilometers away. These temporary houses were built as a quick fix solution, but about three years later, they still serve as the main residence of the evacuees. Saito shares a small unit with his wife and his mother. They say the idleness of living in temporary housing has weakened them, physically and mentally. They miss the days when they worked hour after hour in the fields. But their hometown is still off limits because of high radiation. Residents need special permission to go back. This footage was taken when Saito visited his house about a year after the disaster. He was able to stay for only a few hours. He was devastated by what he saw. His spinach greenhouses were overgrown with weeds, and rats had invaded his home. Still, Saito did not give up hope that someday he would return. But last year, he received another shock. The government announced a plan to build a storage facility for nuclear waste in Saito's hometown. His property is on the proposed site. The facility would hold radioactive soil collected from areas across northeastern Japan for 30 years. Saito knows if that plan goes through, he'll never return to Futaba. I remember my hometown, and I wonder, why were we forced to leave? Why do we have to be here? I want the government to decontaminate our land and save our community, no matter how long it takes. Many evacuees are still living in limbo three years after the disaster. Saito is still hanging on to the hope that he'll be able to return to his house and farm, a hope that he knows is growing more distant by the day.